Hello everyone, this is Seth Chandler and welcome to this episode of PCGS's Slab Lab. Really excited, we got our, our first time WorldCoin specialist here. Your first guest uh, that focuses on WorldCoins, uh, Mr. Mark Teller. So Mark, nice to actually meet you. Nice to meet you. And thank you for coming on the show. Thanks. Yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you're from and how you got started collecting well, coins. Well, I was born in Buenos Aires, but I came here when I was uh, two years old. And uh, so I'm basically a homie in California, uh, educated in New York. Uh, and but I've lived most of my life other than during certain periods where I had to be away. But I've traveled, to give you an idea of how much you have to travel to buy these coins. I'm a diamond or gold or premium in almost every airline I've put on in the last 50 years, probably around 15 or 20 million miles on airplanes flying See? to buy these coins. Wow. So you enjoy the hunt, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. It's when yeah. you can turn your hobby mm -hmm. into your profession, mm -hmm. there is no greater joy. Mm -hmm. You really appreciate right, it because yeah. you're a collector. And you're also a dealer, mm -hmm. so you have a. You don't think in terms of the the collector as being a target to sell things to. You want to make them happy. I'm I'm the guy that always finds the stuff that nobody else can right. find, and that's my specialty. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of the searcher. Sure. Know? Yeah. How did you get started collecting coins? Uh, my father was a diplomat during the Second World War. And he was in Europe just after the war, and at that time there were a lot of coins around gold coins. So he brought a lot of European gold coins mm -hmm. back home. Mm -hmm. And in Argentina there were Latin coins, and mostly Argentinian gold coins. And my dad and my grandfather had a fascination with gold. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they gave me a nice cigar box, wooden one, and in there were a pile of silver coins and about 15, 16 gold coins, really? mm -hmm. 20 franc size sovereigns, things like that. Mm -hmm. You could buy in those days for anywhere from seven to nine dollars. Okay. So I had this cigar box full mm -hmm. of coins. And there were a lot of German coins and silver coins of, you know, of Europe, mm -hmm. of Central Europe, no British. And I was fascinated with them. And then one day my grandfather gave me the gold coins. And I started looking at them and I was really that caught my eye. Mm -hmm. And originally, I was strictly a dealer in gold foreign coins. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, I do deal in U.S. coins, but only on the on the top levels mm -hmm. because there's too much competition down below. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, we deal in like Charlotte, Dahlonega gold mm -hmm. and high grade, mm -hmm. things sure. like that. But foreign gold is our forte and crowns. So how did you, how did it kind of bite? You know, you had this cigar box full of coins. And I would take so, them out and I would uh, look at yeah. them. And there were no, there were almost no catalogs then. Mm -hmm. This was in 1954, 55. Mm -hmm. There were no catalogs around. And then a couple of catalogs, we couldn't find half the coins in the catalogs because mm -hmm. they were either too early or too late. But, you know, I, I just kept acquiring coins. I was lucky. I lived in West Los Angeles. And in Beverly Hills, uh, there were several very important coins. Like Admiral Kreisberg and Abe Kossoff. At, Abe yeah. Ka well, Kossoff was near where I lived in Encino. Mm -hmm. But Admiral Kreisberg, Jerry Cohen, mm -hmm. uh, they opened the B Max Mel store there. B Max Mel was long dead, but there were a number of very important dealers there. Harry Gordon, who owned Numismatics Limited. And, uh, you know, I had a fairly good allowance. Thank goodness I had mm -hmm. good grandparents. And of consequence, I had money to spend. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you could buy a sovereign for $8. Wow. Yeah. You could buy a French 20 franc piece for about $7. Yeah. And I just would go there and I was trying to put together date sets and mm -hmm. mint sets. And how old were you at the time? Uh, I think I started when I was about seven and a half. So you were going there at that age? or? Oh, yeah. Wow. Going I mean, by, wow. Kids could okay. go anywhere in those days. Got okay. This is a different story. Okay, now. so you're on your own in seven yeah. and a half, eight Get on old. the bus and go. Got it. You know? With pocket full of money buying gold Well, coins. I used to have about a 10 or $15 a week yeah, allowance. Yeah, that's some serious money. But the, my yeah, grandparents yeah. encouraged me and my mother uh -huh. to buy coins. They mm -hmm. liked the idea I was buying coins. And I will say this, that Jerry Cohen took me under his wing. That was... Uh, coin galleries that was Abner Kreisberg and Jerry Cohen took me under his wing and he really taught me a lot mm -hmm. and but as, it was strictly as a collector not as a dealer mm -hmm. 
And he told me what to buy. So he said, always buy. Better to buy one good coin than a bunch of cheap coins. Mm -hmm. Better to buy quality than just mm -hmm. buy something that you can just barely read. Yeah. Now he taught me the basic essentials of collecting. Mm -hmm. And just remember, if it's garbage in, it's going to be garbage out. Yeah. Buy yeah. a nice coin going in. I mean, you buy a nice BCGS graded coin, and it's not going to change. The mm -hmm. grade is there. The authenticity is there. You're not taking a shot because you do have to be careful of counterfeits. Sure. It's a big consideration. Pretty heavy. Is and even in then, ones. when I was started collecting, there were Lebanese counterfeits everywhere mm -hmm. of all the gold coins just mm -hmm. and silver coins. Mm -hmm. And it was just all over the place. So how did you make the transition from a collector to a dealer? Like what age were you? Or? Uh, that took place about 1970. Well, no, actually about 1967. Okay. Uh, I had been away for several years abroad, and uh, I came back, and uh, I had been in the restaurant business. I had several businesses going, and my grandparents uh, were in commercial real estate, and they also owned a very important uh, financial business in Hollywood. It was mm -hmm. called Hollywood Pawn, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they bought fabulous stuff. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather, when I was 13, gave me a pan pack set. And that really sent me flying. Wait, so you got a pan pack set when you were 13 he years old? He bought it. Uh -huh. He bought it when he first came to the United States. Because he, he was a coin buff. Wow. Uh -huh. And he bought it for, I think, $3,900. So, oh, in the yeah, box. Yeah. In the box. That's worth, you know, four or $500,000 today. Yeah. And the graves, those are, I still have it mm -hmm. in the box. Oh, really? Yeah, the original box. Uh, frame. Yeah, it was not a box. It's a frame. You got the original pan pack in a copper frame. In a copper frame. Well, there's two frames. Mm -hmm. There's one that's the original frame, and there's one that was uh, made by stacks because there were only so few frames that they could sell it in for people that wanted to put together a set. Oh, wow. Not clandestinely. It was, you know, the first just, one was three, right? Oh, oh no, there were more. There were, there were, there were many, many frames. Maybe there were three or four double frames, you know, double, sure, uh, double yeah. sets. This was just a single fret wow. thing in a frame, and the frame was set in a box. Mm -hmm. In a nice box, flush box, wow. and uh, so I got really got myself rolling. When I was in college, every nickel I had, I would go to stacks on go to mm -hmm. stacks on Friday afternoon mm -hmm. and unload every nickel I had. Mm -hmm. And while I was away at college, I played Middle Eastern music in a mm -hmm. in a nightclub, and I was making forty three dollars a night. That yeah, was Union of Scale. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of money in mm -hmm. the night early sixties. So every nickel of it went into coins, mm -hmm. and it went into nice coins, gold coins, and mm -hmm. other things. I had far gone by the, I left the, the sovereign and 20 franc stage and started buying multiple ducats and other things. So as a young man in your early 20s, your collection is getting very, very substantial. And my collection is uh -huh. very, I never mm -hmm. really sold anything from my mm -hmm. collection as mm -hmm. of yet. I'm actually selling a very rare collection right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, But it's something that I never was able to complete. And at my age, you don't uh -huh. want to carry more. Most of my stuff is going to my grandkids. Mm -hmm. I, I specialized in Chinese, mm -hmm. Korean gold, but the early stuff, not the other mm -hmm. stuff. Japanese typesets, Indian gold coins. How did you learn this? Gold. Like the resources back then were very limited. It was mostly dealers. It's and whatever books. you saw that looked uh -huh. good and according to your eye. Especially, mm -hmm. I really had a fascination with proof sets. I remember going to a. Um, a coin show at the Statler Hilton in Los Angeles, probably it was 1970 or 71, mm -hmm. and buying there was a guy named Bernth, no, not yeah, Bernth Alstrom, who I think may be still around, and he had a Colombian proof set of 1848 that had some hellacious coins in it, and I actually borrowed twelve thousand dollars from a friend. Mm -hmm. To go buy it, twelve thousand dollars then yeah. was a third of a house. Yeah, it's a know? big deal set then. It was a, yeah, a big deal set and. That I still have. I still have a lot of things. There were only four sets made, presentation sets mm -hmm. from the... Actually, they were made not in Colombia. They were made in France. Mm -hmm. All the Colombian coins, the proofs, and specimens. So when, you're, when you're, you said you used your eye, I mean, back then, I mean, did you have a lot of books about certain issues? Or you when you look at a dealers? coin like this that yeah. looks like a proof with full luster, mm -hmm. that's a coin that catches your eye. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, just yeah. happens to be a rare coin on top mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm an eye buyer. But I started to go to different sets, and I started building Asian sets. Then I went to Transylvania. 
uh, I got into German 20 marks and 10 marks. You know, you, mm-hmm. And in those days, up until 1973, 74, coins were just insanely cheap. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the egg cracked, mm-hmm. and everything started to go up. I see. When did you become a dealer? What year? Well, that's a good question, because mm-hmm. I, started, I was selling coins as a vest pocket person, just for mm-hmm. fun, mm-hmm. in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. And I had met a lady who was a lovely woman, and they were very conservative, and they were part of the John Birch Society, and part of their tenant was gold. They wanted, they believed in handling gold, and this is part, a large part of the conservative element within our country today still wants gold. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sold her and her friends, her her husband was what they call a Birch leader, he led a group Mm-hmm. of the John Birch Society, sure. like, you know, like a, a group of them. And they all bought gold for me, and that kind of started me off. And I never thought of being a dealer until then. And I realized, you know, I can go there and make some real money. And real money then wasn't a lot, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. by today's standards. But it sort of, you know, got me moving, got the juices flowing. And when I graduated from college and got done with my service, I decided to just do this. I didn't want to do anything else. Okay. And I hit it on an upmarket. Did you open up a coin shop or no, you never, like private? I always office? had an office. I never okay. wanted to be on a ground floor. Uh-huh. I always decided that I would keep the coin prices up. Not to, not high prices, but coins that were more expensive. I didn't really want to walk around with boxes and boxes mm-hmm. of dollar to fifty dollar coins. I just didn't want to have to drag them around. Mm-hmm. And you don't realize how much weight that is. Yeah. Gold uh, adds I, up always, too. I, I never kept a, a rolling inventory of maybe more than ten or fifteen double row boxes. Mm-hmm. Not not including my collection. And also we have a reserve stock that we for years we put away. We mm-hmm. buy a nice collection, take out 10, 12 coins and sell the rest and that was just the fruit of the vine that sure. was left. So tell me this, though. There's a lot of uh, there's going to be thousands of people that watch this video. There's going to be a lot of collectors of U.S. coins, and I think a, a lot of a lot of collectors, including myself, are very fascinated by foreign coins. And uh, but we just don't know where to start. What recommendations would you give to a collector that well, wants to? Well, if you there's many things you can do. Mm-hmm. You can collect by design. If you just mm-hmm. go with your eye and you stay with older coins, you mm-hmm. have to realize that modern coins are beautiful. But it's probably in your lifetime. You're never going to make the profits you're going to make with coins from the 19th, early 20th century, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century. Mm -hmm. You need to buy quality, though. And I would say better to buy one coin than 100 lesser coins. Mm -hmm. And if you start with coins that have low mintages and have low populations, that's where you have to be. Almost every one of these coins is a consensus coin. And many of them are top pop. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's primarily what I sell. Mm-hmm. I've, as I said, I'm selling a collection of coins that's going out. And virtually of the 95 coins, almost every one of them is the top pop. Mm-hmm. And I'm a fisherman. I keep... Yeah. I keep throwing back the little sure. ones and buying the sure. bigger ones until I upgrade to the point that I get the best. Mm-hmm. But you have to start somewhere. And you don't have to be rich to start. You have to be interested to start. Mm-hmm. And you have to have, look at it as a collection. And then you hope that the things you bought will increase in value. There's no way. It's like a stock market. But if you buy a low mintage coin that's 10 years old, let's say, like buy a 1990 coin. Okay, it's 40 years old, or 30 years old, excuse me, uh, that has a population of three or 400, well, there's not going to be any more of them. Sure, sure. And as time goes by, they'll evaporate, they won't be around, they won't show up as much, and the price will go up. Also, countries. If you stick with major countries uh, in, in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, the Russian coins went crazy when Russia opened up in 91, but now they're dropping off because there's a lot of issues going on. They can't sell them out of the country. Two of the major dealers uh, were killed in a plane accident, and things change in markets. But if you stay with France, England, uh, Switzerland, you go to Japan, China, India, big countries, big populations, countries that have a good history, a past, 
then you know you're going to have coins. Same coins, coins collectors. So when you look at you know the U.S. coin market, it's it's one broader. It's the U.S. coin market. Do they act similar? Like is there the the Japanese market completely different than say the Chinese market or the German market? Are they all completely independent and they're driven by people? You know, no, no, that's not so. Okay, how does um, it work? For instance, I'm just going to flash these. Sure. There's a couple of U.S. coins that are in the twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand dollar range. This is um, a CC 18, uh, what is it? I can't even read the date anymore. I just pulled these out of the box. Uh, this is an 1890 CC, and it's a MS62, but it's only one graded higher. And this is a De Alonaga 1847 in MS62, which is almost an unheard of grade. And the coin is just all flash. And these coins are in the $20,000, $30,000 range. But when you get into these coins, there are still a lot of really great rarities that can be bought anywhere from really $1,500 to ten dollars or $12,000. And of course, you can go up to a million dollars if you want to, mm. you know. And uh, in the last year or two, uh, several European and, uh, well, European and Asian coins have brought a million dollars plus. Mm -hmm. And ancient coins, that's a whole different field. That I leave to the professionals mm -hmm. and the ancient coins. But overall, if you buy nice coins and you have a good guide who will tell you the truth, finding a good coin dealer is, first, that's number one. Number two is, if you decide on an area to collect, get the books from the country itself. Okay, that's... And, and read it, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Their prices are not always realistic. Mm -hmm. But the information is is realistic. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago, a guy put out a book in Peru on Peruvian coins, mm -hmm. and he had the lowest prices I've ever seen. Right. But it was a wealth of information. Right, I see. Okay. So what you want to do is read about right. read, read about that. Remember, books don't buy and sell coins. They're a, a repository of information, and you need that information yeah. to make wise decisions. That's a very interesting component because, you know, with the information available on Google, but you, in some countries, you had the expert, there was a local collector, for example, in Peru, and they wrote the book, but to buy the book in the country about their coinage, very good. Well, that yeah. was a particular, that was a good laugh in the industry at the mm -hmm. time because he had coins that melted yeah, for more sure, sure. than what he was offering yeah. to buy for sure. them. But it, it was just a fun thing. Mm -hmm. And my business partner is Peruvian, and he's got one of the great Peruvian collections. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were laughing about it because we used to go to Peru and South America mm -hmm. because we we're both Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very easy to go through. In mm -hmm. South America, people in those days really didn't know much about coins. Mm -hmm. Coins, if you bought a, if you found a gold coin, you had a gold coin, you could take it to a store, put it on the scale, and the sure. guy would pay you a little bit under gold weight for it, no matter what it was. Wow, that's crazy. So we used to go to all of all the gold merchants, we used to go to all the coin dealers, mm -hmm. and the coin dealers, if it wasn't a coin from the country, if it came from France and it was in Bolivia, they didn't even know what they had. Right. And it wasn't a matter of stupidity, it was just a matter of ignorance. They didn't mm -hmm. have any... They didn't have any basis for making a price, so it was just a piece of gold. Got it. And uh, even in France back in the 60s and 70s, it wasn't French. Mm -hmm. That was it. They didn't care. Sure, they just sure. wanted to get rid of it. Yeah. That's not the case anymore. What? With, with the advent of uh, the Krause publications and all the publications in all the foreign countries, they... Um, they now have the benefit of pretty much knowing. Also, there's so many auction companies out there. If you follow the auction companies, you can pretty much get an idea sure. of what coins are. Mm -hmm. uh, the main thing that I can instill is in them, and the reason we're here is because of PCGS, is because this is your guarantee. And I'm not saying because I'm not getting paid anything for this. This is your guarantee. You're getting what you're paying for. And... Uh, you just can't, this, until grading came along, professional grading, people were just ducks ready to be shot out of the sky. And now that element has been taken away. Now you have professionals grading your coins, telling you what they're worth, telling you how many they are. And it's great for me, just as a dealer. I mean, I go to the population reports all the time. It's valuable information. You know? really yeah, I mean, constantly mm -hmm. I'm looking at the population of coins. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, most of these coins are less than a thousand inches. Yeah, let's talk about. Let's talk about these now. These are. Really